uh, blowout week of, of uh, ocean policy madness every year during Capitol Hill Oceans Week. Um, but this year, thanks to Secretary Kerry and the Our Ocean Conference, um, we get a second bite at the apple. So um, we're, uh, we're excited for that. I know that's what's brought so many of you to town today, and, and we thank you for taking a little extra time to be here uh, with us. Um, 2006 is also uh, a milestone year for American fishery management. Uh, it's the 40th anniversary of the initial passage of the Fishery Conservation and Management Act. Um, it's also the 20th anniversary of the sustainable, sustainable, uh, and arguably the most sustainable anywhere in the world. Um, and it served as a blueprint for other nations to follow, most notably uh, in the European past, uh, Congress. I was um, fresh out of graduate school. I was working as a Sea Grant Fellow, one of 10 Sea Grant Fellows on uh, Capitol Hill at that time, uh, supporting the ranking member uh, of the Senate Subcommittee on Oceans, Atmosphere, Fisheries, and Coast Guard, Senator Olympia Snow from what is now my home state of Maine, and, and as well as uh, one of the legislation's namesakes, uh, Senator Stevens from Alaska. Um, and it was the first major piece of legislation that I really worked on when I got to, uh, to, the, cap to, to the Hill. And, and the night uh, the bill passed, um, my fellow fellows and I were all at my apartment in Capitol Hill. It was the last night of the legislative session, and Congress was trying to uh, finish up and, and go home for the holidays. Uh, and so while our spouses and our significant others were all sort of off doing, you know, holiday party things and, and uh, you know, finding the, the fridge and the, uh, having some conversations around the dinner table, we were all um, hovered over C-SPAN uh, watching House floor proceedings like it was the Super Bowl. It was um, <laughs> probably the nerdiest Christmas party I've ever thrown, uh, fortunately. Um, and uh, uh, and while for us it was the culmination of a year of hard work, um, others like Margaret Spring, our third panel, um, and I also want to take just a moment to mention, I know that some of you saw this on the way in, but today we uh, at CAP also released um, a new report, um, uh, the America's Blueprint for Sustainable Fisheries. Um, there were copies available in the back, I think they've been going pretty quickly, but it's also available uh, on our website for download, um, and it really explores some of the history uh, of the Magnuson Act uh, with a focus on how the, our uh, science-first reforms and the science-based um, attitude of the law um, has really put American fisheries unaccounted for in future years, um, and combating uh, illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing activity uh, around the globe, which has become really one of Secretary Kerry and President Obama's highest priorities uh, in the ocean policy sphere. Um, and of course, it has recommendations uh, for future action to ensure that these uh, that these uh, the law can maintain and, and really build upon these gains. Um, so uh, we'll have about an hour this afternoon for a conversation uh, about Magnuson, about fishery management, about uh, its role in uh, around the world as a model, uh, as well as some of the effect that it's had so far uh, for helping other nations uh, ensure their fishermen continue to operate profitably, sustainably, while maintaining uh, healthy fish stocks. Um, and so I'll begin by moderating our conversation for about 40 minutes, then we'll open it up to questions. Uh, mics will be passed through the audience, so you can prepare your questions. My immediate right, Dr. Jane Lubchenco, is a distinguished uh, professor and advisor in marine science at Oregon State University. Uh, recently completed her year-long tenure as U.S. Department of State's science envoy for the ocean, uh, and previously served as administrator of NOAA for four years under President Obama, where she oversaw the implementation of many of the provisions in the Magnuson Stevens reauthorization. Um, Maria Dominaki, to her right currently serves as Global Managing Director for Oceans at the Nature Conservancy. Uh, and prior to assuming that role, she was the European Union's Commissioner for of Sustainable Fish Stocks in EU's Waters. Um, so tremendous accomplishments there, of course, Maria. Uh, and finally, Margaret Spring, Vice President of Conservation uh, and Science and Chief Conservation Officer at the Monterey Bay Aquarium in California. Uh, prior to taking this role, she was Jane's Chief of Staff at NOAA, uh, as well as several other on the Senate Subcommittee on Oceans, Atmosphere, Fisheries, and Coast Guard. Um, so Margaret and I have worked together for a long time as well, um, and very much looking forward to this conversation. Um, so providing a bit of perspective from each of their unique positions on um, where we are with fishery management in the U.S., where we are with fishery management globally, um, obviously with a focus on uh, science uh, and availability of uh, of data and for, for management of these issues. Um, but why don't we uh, kick things off? We'll go down the line here and, and start with Dr. Lubchenko um, uh, and just ask generally, um, so what were the biggest challenges and lessons <laughs> learned of implementation of all these revisions from the uh, Magnuson-Stevens law? So let me just say, uh, hi everybody, thanks for joining us today and big thanks to Mike and the Oceans team at Center for American Progress for really shining a spotlight on fisheries and the ocean and giving us an opportunity for a vibrant conversation. 
Um, I want to make so sure that uh, what I say is, uh, and we can come back to some of those, but that has definitely uh, influenced the way I think about a lot of these issues. But thirdly, the opportunity as the first U.S. science envoy for the ocean to travel internationally and do science diplomacy around ocean issues in developing countries has really enriched my perspectives even further vis-a-vis -vis the importance of fisheries for many developing countries as they look to the ocean for new opportunities for job creation, for food security, for poverty alleviation. Uh, and that context, I think, is really important as we think about the future. Um, finally, um, I uh, am a lover of seafood. Uh, and so I appreciate the ocean both from an intellectual standpoint, a culinary standpoint, uh, but an emotional standpoint too. I really appreciate being in, on, and uh, around uh, healthy oceans. Uh, and I understand how important ocean literacy and ocean education is. Molar, and she was looking in, in, in the mirror and she said, Daddy, it looks like my mouth is growing a barnacle. <laughs> and I thought, yes, <laughs> we're succeeding. So uh, that gives you a sense of where I'm coming from. Um, focusing on fisheries in uh, sustainable fisheries in a changing world uh, is a really daunting task. Um, and I think I would say first and foremost that no one should underestimate the difficulties in getting sustainable fisheries from each other about how to do that. I'd also say, number two, that there are immense opportunities to get it right and have immense benefits cover depleted species. It's not easy, but it is possible. Uh, and I think the numbers that are emerging from the U.S. experience speak for themselves and are worth focusing on, not with lots of charts and figures, but just a few numbers to put on your radar screen. So acknowledging that there is a lot left to do, acknowledging that we're not where we need to go, but that we have made significant progress. Um, I'm going to compare just the year 2000 to the year 2015 and just give you two numbers uh, or two categories. One is the number of overfished species, I think the engagement. In the year 2000, we had zero stocks that had been uh, uh, overfished to the point that they uh, needed to be, um, so overfished and then rebuilt to the point that they could be fished again. Uh, so zero, and by 2015, we had uh, 39. So that's really important. That says it is possible to do it. So what have we learned? What did it take? Strong and sustained leadership, political leadership, policy leadership, NGO leadership, fishing community leadership, scientific leadership, sustained through years and years and years is really key. This doesn't happen overnight. Um, five, the importance of independent third-party validation certification to sort of shine a spotlight and, and have uh, a trusted outside source of how are we doing is really important. Um, six, a, an explicit plan to recognize that there is inevitable pain that comes with um, uh, reduced uh, catches. And you have to have an explicit way of acknowledging that and g making the transition so that you can get from declined catches to a better place, which is possible. So uh, I think there's a lot of creative thinking to be done around how do we enable that transition? How can we have secure financing? How can we make fishermen are innately conservation minded? But under many types of fishery management programs, there is no incentive for them to conserve today uh, because if in a race to fish uh, fishery, if I don't fish as hard and as fast as I can, then Maria is going to and she's going to catch all the fish. So rights-based approaches to fisheries are not a panacea, but they, if they are well designed and well implemented, can be incredibly powerful in uh, aligning short-term and long-term incentives. And in fact, the combination of the strong mandates uh, and all the other things I mentioned 
plus the adaptation of catch share programs in some fisheries in the U.S. has really resulted in some very impressive uh, changes. Uh, the analyses that have been done today suggest that the fishermen operating under catch share programs now have more stable and profitable businesses. Uh, fishing jobs in recent years have increased in those fisheries and rights right which does not always mean a rights-based program, but getting the incentives right is really key. So I just highlight those uh, reflections as a way of putting some ideas on the table. Uh, it doesn't say where we need to go from here, but it just is to start the conversation about what have we learned about the successes that we've had. Yeah, that's great. And it's a perfect place to launch the conversation from. We have to figure out how we got to where we are before we figure out where we go next. So. Um, Maria, do you want to provide some perspective there as well from, from the, the EU, from the other side of the Atlantic? Well, for the moment I'm here <laughs> in the States, right. and I would like to thank you, of course, and uh, uh, all of you that you are here. I know that this is a very busy week for everybody around the ocean, so I very much appreciate that you are present. And I would like to say that uh, we are very excited, me and my team in TNC, to read your report and uh, learn from you. But um, going back to the Magnuson-Stevens Act, I would like to say that um, I really believe it's a very, very strong piece of legislation. It survived uh, so many governments here in the States and also the revisions and everything. So it's obvious that uh, somebody has done a very good work. <laughs> and uh, looking back to the past, I can say that last decades were um, uh, the decades uh, of, uh, as I say, revolution of policy and decision makers and legislators, because we have put very, very strong pieces of legislation about the ocean management and fisheries there. And the uh, uh, United States uh, were there first, but also in European Union, Norway, other countries. I'm saying all that because I really believe that we all have to learn from each other wherever we are. And uh, Jane already mentioned, but I would like to underline that referring to fisheries, uh, international cooperation, in my view, is number one. We cannot do fisheries sustainable uh, management without international cooperation for a lot of reasons. For a lot of reasons. The obvious reason is that fish uh, is moving, they don't have a passport, they are, so we have to manage them um, collectively. But it's not far beyond that than that. We are uh, nations around the world. If you see the planet, it's going to be cooperative to us. So international cooperation is a very, very important point here. We have to learn from each other. And really, in, this, in the in European Union, when I was there as a commissioner, we have learned a lot. And I think that also United States uh, and the USA government is now working with the European Commission, and they are learning from them. Because it's very, very effective. And maybe it's more effective than other systems. So I don't know if a uh, United States uh, fisheries is the most well sustainable, uh, sustainable fisheries in the world, but for sure you have done a great, great progress. And everybody has done a great, great progress. Big challenge of implementation of all this good legislation, and implementation is not as easy. For all the people who are on the spot, this is obvious, because then you go there and you have a good piece of legislation, but then we need money, we need funding, we need cooperation. All these uh, science, uh, uh, Jane mentioned everything. I don't want to repeat here. So it's much more complicated. This is my point. So implementation is uh, in front of us and implementation at a global level, not only at a USA or a European or whatever level, which makes the things difficult. Beyond that, I would like also to place this issue in the broader framework. And the broader framework is the ocean. The ocean as a whole, ecosystem services, but ocean as a whole. So what is happening now, if we look to the ocean, what is happening is amazing because the blue economy is soaring. If you see the map, you will see that until 2030, for example, the um, wind energy projects that will be placed in the ocean will raise up 8,000 times. 8,000 times. Aquaculture, if we're talking about uh, fisheries, perhaps we have also to have aquaculture in mind. Aquaculture 
uh, is going to increase 300 percent around the world. These are challenges. I mean, the Arctic is not uh, a sacred place anymore. Fish uh, vessels are coming and go. My point here is it is up to us to decide. Do we want to save the planet and the ocean or not? It's as simple as that. So it's just to take the, the good decision. And then one last point. We have also climate change. And we cannot ignore that climate change affects a lot, not only fish. Um, and we have to believe them up to a point, or to trust them at least. And it seems that everything about fisheries, habitats, um, ma marine special plants are there. I can mention cooperative management. We need co-management, actually. We cannot do that without uh, fisheries. I can mention science, technology, and data. Data. We don't have the, co the, the concrete data for everything. and. Uh, uh, all, all the, um, the, which is very, I mean, Im important or new to everybody, to anybody. But I would like to say that uh, the money of conservation worldwide, we have to change the whole bucket, the money that is going to conservation. So uh, we are working now in the Nature Conservancy, and I mention that because I think it's critical, it's crucial to leverage this money. So uh, it's not enough to have some money from the donors, but we can leverage this money through smart, uh, innovative tools. For example, we are using debt, etc. Blue bonds are coming. Uh, innovative financing tools about fees, user fees. I mean, the nature is there, but we have to pay for the use of ecosystem services, and people are making profits out of the ocean, so they have to pay for that. So we need smart, innovative ideas for the future of the conservation. And I'm sure that we are taking the, path, the good path, but we have a lot more to do. So this is my point. Thank you for this opportunity. Great. Absolutely. No, it's a, that's a lot, uh, a lot of opportunity and uh, a lot of challenges. So and it's a lot for us to talk about here as we, uh, as we move forward. Um, before we move to the challenges of the future, though, I do want to take a few more minutes to talk about uh, the challenges that were overcome in order to get as far as we have uh, gotten with fisheries management in this country and um, nobody better. They stand in the shoes of a lot of people who worked on this bill over the years and from the day it was created in 1976 to the final uh, final I was dotted and the T was crossed at the end of 20 2006. The um, story of the Magnuson Act is one of um, pride in uh, in, in your country, essentially, uh, but also trying to figure out how to do the best for the country and, and the goals we have. And uh, there were a number of s phases of the reauthorization. Um, the 76 reauthorization authorization essentially Americanized our, our EEZ. It was a, a hard fought um, uh, legislative battle uh, by Senator Magnuson himself and a number of others, including Senator Stevens of Alaska, Senator Magnuson being from Washington State, uh, to actually um, kick out the foreigners, so to speak, from before, you know, our EEZ was declared, uh, Congress acted in defiance of the State Department and others uh, to, to take back our, our, our areas. Unfortunately, though, while that was a great, great move, uh, I think what happened was we, um, we were too enthusiastic in exploiting it, and in uh, some areas of the country, um, essentially, find out later it wasn't such a good idea. And in fact, um, uh, in the in the second re in the reauthorization, the, the the most I think the the most the idea of optimum yield and maximum sustainable yield were in the statute, but there was a little bit of flexibility, and so um, that the the statutory changes then really capped it capped your your quotas. It's really fabulous fishery was sobering, and so the people who were involved in that process, Senator Kerry. Uh, Senator Stevens, uh, Senator Noe, Senator Hollings, others in the Senate, and many others in the Gary Studs in the House, as well as um, Don Young in the House. That that became a very um, poignant and very scary moment, uh, and so that that set the stage for um, thinking about how can we do it better. And uh, Alaska and the West Coast had set um, some innovative ideas forward. And so in the, in the two, two, 1999 a re, a beginning reauthorization process that led to 2006 final passage was, uh, was a process of seeing how well did we actually do in um, Despite the fact that we put in place uh, uh, requirements to end overfishing and rebuild fish stocks, 
Um, there was an annual status of the stocks report, which said, yeah, we're actually not, not getting it done. And so the changes that we were able to put in place in ultimately in 2006 stemmed from a problem solving process. It took about uh, two of them were uh, really important, um, which were the Pew Ocean Commission report and the U.S. Commission on Ocean Policy report, which in addition to us doing regional hearings all over the country, those experts were actually doing an ocean, an ocean-centric review, a chapter of which was about fisheries. And in addition, the agency was doing regional workshops. And so we were all sort of trying to find, get on the same page with the facts, which we did, get on the same page with the recommendations, which we did. And we had leaders who had witness and accountability was so important. And, um, and that is, you can't hide uh, the results and you actually have to be true to the science and, and you have to agree on what your goal is. And when everybody agreed in 96 that we wanted to end overfishing, by the time we got around to seeing we hadn't done it, we knew we hadn't met our goal. And so I think having a common goal and, com and, and, and having common facts really helped us get through that. And, and in general, I think this uh, process, and it was, I could go into lots of uh, stories and um, anecdotes, uh, which would be kind of fun, but um, essentially there's a road map here. And there's a lot of mistakes made along the way. There were a lot of things we did with this waste lawyer, perfectly uh, positioned to work on fisheries. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> now I work for uh, the Monterey Bay Aquarium, and we uh, operate the Seafood Watch program, which actually does rate performance of fisheries and aquaculture operations according to criteria that are very similar to the Magnuson Act. And I'll tell you that U.S. fisheries are faring work very well. Um, and uh, largely the major problems we're, we're seeing, other than the climate change impacts on fish stocks and bycatch, uh, bycatch issues that's, that probably could be solved by set globally that you have to end overfishing by 2020. And uh, that's a big challenge. So I think the good news is we have a roadmap uh, and we have a challenge, we have a goal. So how do we get there? And, and I'm happy to delve into any part of this process, but it was quite a rewarding process that was bipartisan, um, quite uh, fun, sometimes tr tremendous. I mean, there's clearly um, a lot more than Wow, 20 more minutes worth of material for us to right. get into here. But I think uh, let's, you know, I want to I want to kick off certainly by starting with, um, based on you know the audience that we've got, the events that are happening around town this week, uh, the clear priorities for um, the administration, uh, talking about um, IUU international management, um, you know how we can export some of these ideals to um, a, a, a larger stage and a much more diverse stage. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know, we think it's hard enough trying to figure out how to manage fisheries in the U.S. when you've got New England, uh, you've got different, very different perspectives and attitudes and, and ecosystem concerns in, in New England versus Alaska versus Hawaii and the remote Pacific, um, you know, all over these, and, and a similar uh, geographic diversity in Europe. Uh, with the Mediterranean and Scandinavia and all the different regions there that have their own very different issues and approaches. Let's go ahead and open it up to the whole planet. Um, so how does this model, the IUU in, in, in their waters and, and surrounding areas, um, how do we enhance this kind of ecological, uh, international cooperation and capitalize on this opportunity right now? I'll start. Um, just focusing on IUU for a minute, um, I, I think for a long time, uh, Many people thought that it was just sort of this, this impossible to patrol, so large you couldn't uh, really do much about it. More and more information came to the fore about how in huge negative consequences for especially many developing countries. So the, the magnitude of the problem, information about the magnitude of the problem helped trigger some changes. But then many of the things that we've been talking about earlier have really come to the fore to get us to a point where now I think we can see uh, a much uh, easier path, not easier. And when I was at NOAA and Maria was, at, um, was the EU Commissioner for Maritime Affairs and Fisheries, uh, we joined hands across the ocean and said, we're going to work on this together. And it was one of the f first and maybe only things where we had great cheers from the fishing community and the environmental community and government saying, yes, do it, go for it. And so it's a commitment to start action. The, the, now that the Port State Measures Agreement has come into uh, force, 
Uh, that's huge. And uh, Secretary Kerry, Under Secretary Novelli, uh, deserve huge credit from the U.S. side in really helping move that along. There have been many other and being serviced. Then that is a choke point. So that's sort of the, the, the theory, obviously. Um, the new science and new tools that are available now are making that more likely. So we have new use of satellites, of gaming technology, of uh, availability to hand uh, and uh, on the other hand the pew uh, and catapult applications um, eyes on the sea those those are parallel efforts that are really going have the potential to totally transform what people know and see about what's happening uh, in the open ocean and therefore on science technology political leadership increased public awareness that is beginning to make it harder and harder for the bad guys to be bad guys. On the other hand, it's a really, really tough situation because the illegal fishing operations go hand in hand with human trafficking, with drug trafficking, very sophisticated operations, know how to get around the rules, so it's not an easy thing. But I am greatly encouraged, more so than I have been for a long time, about the potential to actually do something about this problem. Uh, and it's developed and developing countries coming together. Uh, key leaders, you mentioned Minister uh, Ibu Susi, uh, who's really been a global leader in this. Uh, and we, uh, we should be cheering her on and doing everything we can to support not only uh, Susi, but other um, countries that are really trying to wrestle with this problem. Um, Maria, you mentioned the, uh, the EU's system of, of issuing yellow cards and red cards to identify uh, nations uh, when their fishery management practices are, are um, insufficient or if they're clearly engaging in these activities. Can you just talk a little bit about that tool and, and how effective it's been um, and whether that might be a model that we could bring over here? Well, I, I'm reluctant to say about models that can be exported here or there. We're, we're reluctant to talk about soccer metaphors as well. So. <laughs> because you see, what I mean is that uh, uh, situations are different and uh, each country has uh, its own political culture and we have, but what uh, is very, very important is that now there is, um, this is an issue very, very uh, discussed worldwide and the public opinion is supporting, very supporting to all these issues against illegal fisheries. Uh, this is the main, the main uh, fact that we have to underline. Because everything happened when the politicians, me included, were persuaded that citizens would like to have legal fish food. When politicians were persuaded that citizens will like legal fish food, then they act and they are going to act more. So I'm very glad that the United States have ratified the uh, port state measure have put that in force for everybody because we have uh, reached the number of the countries that had to ratify. But here comes the difficult part and uh, Jane described it. So I think that uh, we have to have in mind that the implementation of Port State Measures Agreement and all these measures for poor countries, poor countries, not f uh, that are producers of fish, uh, it's rather difficult. So we have to, th there, were, there were some ideas. I don't know if this conference is going to give some solution. We have the forces. We, so uh, the, the need to help them to cooperate about implementation is very, very important. Exchanging information, creating mechanisms, funding the resources, all this makes sense. But I would like also to underline one other point. So policy and society is very important. We would like also, I think, it's very important to include markets. Markets themselves in all this procedure. And the only way to do that is to bring full traceability and transparency to the whole supply chain. Because if there w this will be there, then the, f the f people who fish illegally, markets and society all together to, to, to handle this. I'm just going to say I agree, uh, <laughs> because as a member of Congress, then, the IUU provisions of the Magnuson Act, in fact, they came back over from the House untouched 
uh, not one change. So it was, everyone felt very strongly that if we are asking our own fishermen and communities to abide by scientific rules, then we have to make sure that the, there's a level playing field. So there's an aspect of this that uh, is, is, is very important to understand. But in addition, we need to help people uh, find out, figure out how to do this. And uh, exchanges, even within our own um, uh, country, having exchanges between the different fishery management councils. How did you figure out this? How did you figure out that? The agency ran a nice process where we could talk about that. And producers are coming directly to us to ask how to improve their practices based on our assessments. And you're finding that with probably other groups too. And so I think that, that there's a hunger and an interest in, in making things better uh, because of the market signal. And so working with government hand in hand and, and with um, the public, it's a very exciting time, I think imports from the countries that are not cooperative. So it, it, this had teeth, because if they cannot export, there is no interest anymore to, to fish. So we have to find ways. Yep. Mike, in your uh, question to us, you flagged a couple of issues beyond IUU that we didn't really pick up on. Managing of fisheries, especially in many developing countries, is a very big challenge, a very real issue. And I think it's worth pointing out, understand how many fish are out there and what levels could be sustainable without having to go down the path that many developed countries have done, 